Now, I began this year by preaching about the, the faithful church in Philadelphia. Christ, you may recall, we saw in the third chapter of the revelation of Christ that he had sat and opened the door before that church. He set a door that only he has the key to be able to open, that only he has the key to be able to shut and to lock. He sat it before that faithful church. That door was set before them because they had chosen to keep his word. They had chosen not to deny his name, is what the scripture tells us there. And so I ask all of you today, again, have you chosen to keep his word? Have you chosen not to deny him? Have you chosen not to deny his name? You see, I bring back up this door today because there still is a choice that needs to be made today about that open door. You see, Christ said that he is the door of the sheepfold. And Christ, he said that if anyone enters by him, he said that they will be saved. Do you believe it? Christ, he said that they will go in and they will go out. And when they go out, he said that they will find pasture under his keep and under his care. Do you believe that today? You see, I want you to understand today that Christ, he has made himself accessible, not to some people, not to just a nation of people, not to just a specific race of people. Christ, as that door, he has made himself accessible to everybody, to all people. Do you believe that today? And Jesus, if you don't believe that, he said in the seventh chapter of Matthew's gospel, in the seventh and the eighth verse, Jesus, he said that anyone who comes and knocks, he said that that door, it will be open to them. And so to me, that door, it is very important. That door, it is very important to me. Entering into that door is very important to me. It's everything to me. It's my life. It is why I preach to you today. You see, I, I want you, I want you to choose God. That is what I hope is your choice today, that you will choose God and that you will choose his riches. That you will choose him and that you will choose to enter into his riches. Now, some of you, you may be thinking to yourself, well, pastor, I've already made that choice. I've already chosen God. I've already chosen to enter into his riches. Some of you may begin to think, well, I, this sermon may not be for me because I've already made my choice. I'm just like you, pastor. I've already made my choice and, and I've chosen Christ. I have chosen to believe. I have chosen to have faith. I have chosen to, to walk by faith. I believe in the death. I believe in the resurrection. I believe in everlasting life in his kingdom. And, and if you have made that choice today, I say to you, wonderful. I, I say to you today, if you have made that choice, good for you. It is absolutely good. It is absolutely wonderful that you have made that choice. But I have another word to share with you today if you have made that choice. Again, you have an election and you have a calling to make sure. What I mean by that is that our election is that God, he has chosen us. God, he has chosen us. God, he loves us. We know that we have been chosen. We know that we have been loved. We know that we have been done so along with the rest of the world because, again, God gave the world his only begotten son, right? 
And so again, we were chosen. We have been loved by the Lord in our election. But again, we have a calling as well. We have a calling that we should be striving today to fulfill. Christ, he gave to us a task, didn't he? And the task that Christ gave to us is to minister, to share the good news of his gospel with not some people, not with just our family, not just with our friends, not just with those who are of the same race as us, not to those who are just of the same nation as us, but to the world, to everybody, to all people. So again, something that we must realize today is that there are many of those that are around us that have not made the choice. There are many of those that are around us that have not made the choice. There may be even some within our own homes that have not made the choice, that may have not chosen God today. And so we see there in my key verse that the writer of the epistle to the Hebrews, he pointed out that should one sin willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, the writer said there awaits a certain fearful expectation of judgment. If again, one sins willfully, there awaits, the writer said there, a certain fearful expectation of judgment which will come from the Lord, God's fiery indignation, the writer said there. Again, this is why I preach God's judgment, his fiery indignation. It is why I am moved to preach. Though we have made the choice, again, we must be diligent to make our calling and our election sure for all of those that are around us that have not made the choice. Do you agree with me today? You see, I don't know about you, but I don't want a soul to be lost to the fiery indignation of the Lord today. I don't want my brothers or my sisters to, to be lost to eternal condemnation. And I hope you notice that I use the plural there because I only have one brother and I only have one sister. But I don't want my brothers or my sisters, mankind, all those like me, to be lost to the judgment of God when he judges those who choose to sin willfully. I don't want a soul to be lost today. So something that we must remember today as believers is that those who have not made the choice, they may be struggling in making that choice. And they may be struggling in making that choice for, for a few reasons. We must remember that there are external forces that are doing their best to, to, to not only hinder us, but to hinder those that are around us, to keep others from making the choice of choosing the Lord today. We know today that Satan, that he is in the world. We know today that Satan, that he is alive. We know today that Satan, that he is active in our world Today, we know that Satan, that he is waging war against God, and we know that the devil, he wages war against God through us by attacking not just us who believe, but again, attacking those who are of the world. The devil does not want anybody to be saved. The devil doesn't want anybody to be blessed to receive God's reward. We know that not only is the devil active in the world today, but again, we have seen and we know that the spirit of Antichrist, that it is moving in the world today. 
We know that the spirit of Antichrist, we know that it is moving in the world today, seeking to de destroy anything that is in its path from reaching its own glory. You see, the spirit of Antichrist, we know and we have seen, it desires to be exalted, to be praised rather than the Lord. So again, we know that there are forces at work today trying to keep and hinder us, but also hinder those that are around us from making the choice of choosing the Lord. Not only are there external forces that's creating struggle in the world today, we must not forget that the greater struggle that many people are facing today happens within. There is great struggle that is happening inside, internally today, not eternally, but internally today, that is causing great struggle, that's keeping people from making the choice of choosing the Lord today. Some struggle with, with choosing God today because of their self pity, because of their regrets. Some are even angry. Some are upset. Some are even frustrated with the Lord. And so these are struggles that I want to tackle here in this new series of sermons that I am beginning here today. As much as I have preached about spiritual warfare this year, as much as I have preached about the battles that we face in our daily lives, I tell you today that there is no greater battle than what happens on the inside and what we deal with in internally. Yes, what, what, what happens externally, yes, it troubles us, but what happens internally, it can hinder us in making our decisions. And again, it's decision time today, right now, in this present moment. Will you choose God or will you not choose God? It is decision time today. And again, I tell you, there are many people that are struggling today with choosing God one of the reasons why many people are struggling with choosing God today is over what's true. Many people today are struggling over the truth. And the reason why they are struggling over the truth is because the devil loves to fight the battle over what's true. You see, the one that proclaims to know the truth, they hold great power in their hands. Do you believe that? And so because the one that knows the truth holds great power in their hands, they love to think and, and, and believe that they are all powerful. They are all knowing and everybody should listen only to them. That's the devil. The devil only wants you to listen to him. The devil only wants you to follow his way. The devil, in other words, want you to choose him over the Lord. Will you do that today? You're going to choose the devil over God today? So we must understand the importance, not just uh, for our sake, but we must understand the importance of the truth for everybody that is around us. As a child of God, we must understand the truth. You see, the reason why we must understand the truth today is because what we deem to be true, as you have heard me say before, it sets our morals, it sets our values, it sets our principles. In other words, what we deem to be true the truth, it governs our thoughts and it governs our actions, the actions that we take. It governs, in other words, how we live. Not just we who believe, but again, all of those that are around us, every single person walking this earth, they are governed by what they believe is right. 
they will do what they believe is right and good and again, true. So again, those that proclaim to know us true, they will great power in their hands. And again, the reason why they wield great power in their hands is because they could persuade somebody to listen to them. Because again, they know what's right. They know what's good. They know the truth, which again makes them very dangerous. Because again, they will the power to be able to control one's actions. And that's something that we see happening in the world right now today. So this makes the battle over the truth, what's true. It makes it far reaching. It makes it far reaching because it can reach to the inside internally. It can reach to the soul. It again makes this battle so important for us today. Today, there are many that have received the word of God. They have heard the word of God. But today, there are many that are again struggling with moving to God, moving away from the world and choosing the Lord. And the reason why, again, is because they are uncertain. They are unsure about what's true. Yes, I tell you today, there is and there always has been skepticism about God, about him, about the only begotten son of God that is Christ. And then again, about the scriptures, about the word of God. There again is and always has been skepticism. As you have heard me say before, the devil works hard to make sure that there is skepticism about God. You better believe that old devil, that old lying serpent, Satan himself, he works incredibly hard to create doubt in the soul when it comes to God. Because if you doubt God in your soul, you won't believe. So I say to you today that we, God's children, we who at the start of this sermon was so proud to say, oh yeah, I chose God already, pastor. I already believe. Again, we have an election and again, we have a calling to fulfill. You the child of God, I want you to hear me here today. And I want you to comprehend me here today. You have an election and a calling to make sure today Again, we must combat Satan at every single turn today. Again, not just for ourselves, but for those that are around us, our loved ones, our family, our friends, our acquaintances, our fellow brothers and our sisters in Christ, but even the strangers as well, those who love us that are strangers. But again, those who even hate and despise our guts. We must be willing to combat the devil for them as well, because they too can be saved. Do you believe that today? So we must combat that old devil today because his lies, they are causing many today to neglect the promise of salvation through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To combat these lies, we must understand the denials that's coming from that old evil and wicked spirit of antichrist that is at work in the world today. John, he wrote over in his first epistle in first John, the second chapter and the 22nd verse, John wrote that in order for us to combat the spirit of antichrist, John, he told us what we need to know that the spirit of antichrist is denying. John wrote that the liar denies that Jesus is the Christ. We must combat that lie because Jesus is the Christ, isn't he? John, he also wrote there that he who is antichrist denies the father and the son. Again, 
Jesus said that I and the Father are one. We must combat the lie of the spirit of Antichrist that denies the Father and the Son. As I've said before, the denial of the Father and the Son is not merely done through word. It's also done by deed, through actions as well. You see, the denier denies the Lord by choosing hate over love. I don't know if you hear me here today. Yeah, choose a hate over love. Again, we must combat that lie because love is far greater than hate. Look at the world today for proof. Look at what the world is right now. As I said in the Sunday school lesson, God did not create the world to be as it is today. The denier denies the Lord by blatantly lying, choosing to lie by blatantly creating divisions and seeking to suppress and to oppress others to bring about nothing but destruction while trying to lift themselves up. Again, I tell you today, we must combat that lie because again, God created us to be united as a people. The denial of Christ is, is done, I tell you today, to create internal confusion to create doubt, to again create skepticism of the divine truth that comes from the Lord. As Paul wrote, those who are of the spirit of Antichrist, they seek to sit in God's temple as if they are God. They are not God. And so again, I tell you today, you're a child of God, aren't you? I got an amen. I got an uh-huh. You're a child of God, aren't you? You must combat that devil. So again, we must combat such actions as God's way seek for life to be fruitful. God's way seeks for life to multiply, to prosper, to grow. And so we must talk to the skeptic today. Like I said, it's decision time today. And the skeptic is unsure about what's true. We must talk to the skeptic right now. And so I hope you heed these words. Because again, you may have chosen God already, but somebody somewhere, someone who may be close to you, they may have not made the choice. They may be a skeptic themselves. And so we have, again, an election and a calling to fulfill. So if you're seeking to know what's true about God, but are again skeptical today of what you have heard and, and what you have read, I tell you today, I understand it. I get it today. As Jesus said, there are many false teachers who, who have come. They have come in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves, Jesus said. So let's bring some truth. I tell you today, I am not a wolf in sheep's clothing. I am. I am a sheep. And so let's dive into the word here. So let's first tackle this, this notion here. Is it wrong to be skeptical about the, the message and the messenger? I tell you today, it's actually not wrong to, to be skeptical of the messenger nor is it wrong for anybody to be skeptical of the message as well. Considering, as John said in his first epistle in the fourth chapter and the first verse, there were many false prophets in his day. And John, he had to write, he literally had to write it down and say that one must not believe every spirit. John said that, that one must test the spirits to see whether they are actually of God. Spiritual discernment, that's a real thing. So it's certainly not wrong to be out here in the world today believing every messenger. Do you hear me here today? Because I'm telling you right now, not every messenger is delivering a message that is true today. There are many false messengers in this world today that love to say that they on God's side, but they're a wolf. And you better believe it. When they, when they start howling, don't you ignore their howling. 
Yeah, yeah we in the midst of wolves. Don't forget that. Now, is it wrong to be skeptical and ask God questions about his message? I answer that with what Jesus said. I'll answer that question with words from his lips. In the seventh chapter of Matthew's gospel in the seventh verse, if you don't believe me there, in the seventh and the eighth verse, Jesus, he said, ask and it will be given. Those who ask, they will be answered is what Jesus said there. I tell you today, it is not wrong to have questions. It's not wrong to, to be skeptical about some things. I myself, I have been walking with God for a very long time now. I can add on that very long time now because I'm getting close to, to going bald now. Maybe start finally getting some gray in my hair. I can say very long now, but even as a pastor, I have to go to God with questions a lot of times. You hear me? Not sometimes, but a lot of times I ask God, hey, what's going on? It is not wrong to ask questions. There is absolutely nothing wrong with asking God questions, especially when you're trying to get some clarity. When you're trying to learn, when you're trying to understand, when you're trying to know him, it is not wrong to ask God questions. Because as Jesus said from his own lips, if you come to me and if you ask, I will give you clarity. Now, there's another question that is very common that the skeptic that the skeptic will ask. I didn't say may, I said will. The skeptic will ask this question. The skeptic will ask, how do you know for certain? How many of us have ever heard that one before? How do you know for certain what you believe is true? How many of us have heard that one before? How many of us have asked that question ourselves? When God shows us something and, and, and we begin to wonder and doubt, is this right, God, what you're showing me? I guess ain't nobody had that one before. That one just me, I guess. Oh, I got some uh-uhs there, and Andrew's eyes wide open. <laughs> How do you know for certain that God's truth is the truth? That's the kicker, isn't it? How do you know for certain? This same thought was one that plagued some of those that stood in the presence of Christ. They stood there. They could actually listen. They could see Christ. They could hear him speak. They could hear his words. And they still were skeptical. You know, those religious leaders, they, they needed for Jesus to prove himself, didn't they? They needed Jesus to prove his identity, that he was the son of God, that he was the Messiah, that he was Christ. And so if you turn over to the fifth chapter of John's gospel, and you take a look at scripture that runs from the 31st through the 39th verse, we'll see what Jesus shared with those skeptics that were skeptical about, about his witness. Jesus, he shared in that scripture that his witnesses included John the Baptist. His witness included his works, the scriptures. Jesus said that his father was also a witness of his as well. Now get this as you look at that scripture there. Three of those four witnesses those skeptics, they actually have physical access to. John the Baptist, they chose to kill him. The scriptures speaks of Christ in the Old Testament. He's prophesied about. They had access to the scriptures. And then again, they were there. They were present. 
They could see Jesus move. They could see his works. They could see him heal. They could see all of the miracles. They could see the proof. Yet, with all of that, those witnesses, they were not willing to accept Christ. And then again, some did they say, if I was there. They were not willing to accept Christ so that they may have life. Not in this world, but life eternally. All in all, those skeptics, they, they ended up rejecting five witnesses. They rejected Christ, his witness of himself, they rejected John the Baptist. They rejected Christ's works. They rejected the scriptures. And then they rejected the Father as well. Now, the religious leaders, I want you to understand, they weren't Jesus' only skeptics who were literally in his presence and could watch him move and could hear him speak. They weren't his only skeptics. He had skeptics that were incredibly close to him. When I'm talking about incredibly close, I'm talking about they was able to walk with him every step of the way, sit down and eat with him, have private conversations with him. I'm talking about the 12. One of the 12, he betrayed Jesus. Talk about a skeptic, betrayed him over some silver. And then if you turn with me over to the 14th chapter of John's gospel, you want to see some skepticism? In the 14th chapter of John's gospel, in the first through the 11th verse, we can see where the disciples, they demanded that Jesus show them the Father. They demanded, I want you to understand, proof, prove yourself. They demanded Jesus. In the 8th verse there, we'll see that they said to Jesus that if he showed them the Father, if he proved himself by showing the Father, they said, it will be sufficient, they said there. Look at that. Those who, again, were closest to him. Now, there in that ninth verse, after that demand, we'll see that Jesus, he, he asked Philip a question. He asked Philip, have I been with you so long and yet you have not known me? Has God been with you so long and yet you still don't know him? Jesus, he did ask there in the 10th verse, do you not believe that I am the father and the father in me? Again, do you not believe? Then Jesus, he said that in the 11th verse, he said, believe in me or believe me that I am in the father and the father in me or else Believe me for the sake of the works themselves. I hope you notice that there's a word that Jesus kept repeating there over and over and over and over again. Jesus said, believe, didn't he? How do you know for certain God's truth is the truth? Let me tell you something here right now. There is no scientific experiment that you can run that can prove that God is true. Do you hear me? Do you understand what I mean by that? You, you, can't, you can't go to a lab and doctor up an experiment to prove whether or not God is true. Jesus, he said there in that 14th chapter, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then when, when, when the disciples there were skeptical about that, Jesus' response to them was, believe, 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 believe. Jesus' point to the religious leaders and to his own disciples was to have faith and believe. Will you believe today? Now, I understand that this answer is an answer that won't be sufficient for some of the skeptics. Oh, you just saying believe, Pastor. How can I believe if I don't know for certain? The truth of the matter is this. You can't try to bring logic. And when I say logic, I'm talking about 
the world's logic, logic of the flesh. You cannot bring worldly logic to trying to know the Lord. God, he is beyond this world. God is outside of this world. God is spirit. God is eternal. You can't bring your worldly mind to try to understand the spiritual. There, when we get back to the 10th chapter of the epistle to the Hebrews. The writer quoted there in the 38th verse there, the writer quoted what God said to Habakkuk as recorded in the second chapter of Habakkuk and the fourth verse. The writer quoted that the just shall live by what? The just shall live by what? You see, there is absolutely nothing wrong with asking God questions. They didn't hear me today. There is absolutely nothing wrong with, with even being skeptical. But there comes a moment in time where one has to decide, where one has to choose, believe or don't believe. Have faith or don't have faith. There comes a moment in time where one must have faith and believe. You see, faith is what is needed for one to actually come to know the Lord for certain. Do you hear me? To the skeptic, I say to you today, if you want to know God, if you want to know for certain that God is true, you must taste and see, as David said. You must give God a try in order for you to come to know him. You must go to him. You must talk to him. How can I know for certain? You see, Jesus, he expressed this same notion to the Samaritan woman who was skeptical about him and had questions to him about faith and, and about worshiping the Lord. She said, well, my, my, my fathers, they said we worship in the mountains. And John said, you, you got to praise and worship in Jerusalem. You know what Jesus said to her? Jesus said to her, the hour is coming and now is when true worshipers will worship the father in spirit and in truth. Believe and have faith. Don't be worried about what somebody else said. Believe and have faith in the Lord. And Jesus, he said to her, God is spirit. And, and again, those who worship him, again, they worship in spirit and truth. Have faith and believe. There's nothing wrong with asking questions. There's nothing wrong with asking God questions. But God is going to turn around to you and he's going to say, have faith and believe in me. See, when God shows me something and I am skeptical, the only way I can find out whether it is real or not is for me to step out on faith. You see, if I don't step out on faith, all I'm doing is just standing back, just watching and wondering, thinking and guessing. But again, at some point in time, you have to decide, you have to make a choice. Have faith and believe. You will never know for certain until you actually step out on faith. I don't know if you hear me here today. To the skeptic, if you want to know for certainty that God's truth is the truth, again, I say to you, give the Lord a try. 
if you still doubt right now, you're still saying, I, I need more proof. I need more proof. I need more proof, pastor. Well, let me share with you some proof of God's truth today. Because God, he's still at work today, isn't he? God's still working right now, isn't he? So to continue to, to, to prove God's truth is the truth, I'm going to do just as Jesus did. And I'm going to share some of the same witnesses that Jesus shared with his skeptics. As Jesus told his skeptics, we today, we still have the word of God, don't we? We still have the scripture that, again, proves the identity of Christ. But again, if you are skeptical of God's word, I will point to his works today because again, he's still active and he's still at work today. As a living testimony myself, I always point to what I have gone through recently. Again, when, when I was diagnosed with, with having renal failure, kidney failure, again, I was one who doubted that, that I would make it through it. I thought that I would spend a lifetime having to do dialysis five years on Mother's Day. Mama had them been with me the whole way through dialysis at home treatments. And I watched her work tirelessly helping me out, helping me to make it. And then on Mother's Day, I get a kidney. And you want me to deny my Lord? You want me to deny the Father and that the Father is at work today? I didn't need that proof. But somebody somewhere, they need that proof. You see, if you want me to prove God, this is typically where I go, well, the sun is still rising, isn't it? This is when I would typically say the sun is still setting, isn't it? This is typically when I say, well, the rain is still falls and, and it still nourishes the world so that we can still have things to eat. But I got more for you today. I want you to take notice of, of how that wicked and that evil spirit is at work today. And I want you to take a look at the spirit of Antichrist and how that spirit of Antichrist is at work right now today. And man desires to be exalted. Man desires to be glorified through the gaining of riches, through the gaining of wealth, so that they can believe that they have power. And again, to gain those riches, to gain that power, man moves out of covetousness. Man moves out of envy. Man moves out of lust. Man moves out of greed. Man is selfish in his way. As man will do nothing but move out of selfish ambition, tearing down others to prop themselves up. The world today is filled with war. It is filled with violence. And again, it's filled with oppression and, and suppression today. It is filled with so much bitterness. It is filled with so much anger, so much hatred. So many lies, so many deceptions, where again, people don't know what is right, what is wrong, where people don't know what is true. Yet you want me to prove that God, that his truth is true. In as much turmoil that we are in today, we still here right now, aren't we? You still living, aren't you? You're still breathing, aren't you? You still have conscious thought, don't you? We are still making it, aren't we? Do you think that you're making that by your own power and by your own might? Do you think that the man across the street is the reason why you're still making it today? Do you think that the woman that's across the street, do you think that's why you're still making it today? How you making it? How you making it today? You see, God's righteous right hand is how we making it today, aren't we? Oh, yeah. 
We are not yet destroyed no matter how much we try to destroy one another. No matter how much hate is in this world trying to bring us down, we still rising up against the hate. Again, standing on our own two feet, doing the best that we can to make it. And the reason why we are doing that is because we have God's word. But not only that, God, he is still with us today. And this world, it is in the palm of his hand as it spins around our sun. God is still sovereign. God is still in control. All power is in his hand. If all power is in man's hand, this world would be vacant today. You see, God, he's still restraining that old wicked and that evil spirit, as Paul said. God is restraining it today. The world today is merely a picture of the world that Satan would want. However, again, there is conflict in this world today because, again, God is still in the midst. And the devil can't have his way. Do you hear me here today? The devil can't have his way. Because, again, God is still in the midst. You see, God, he created this world from a place of love. And again, he gives us mankind, his creation. He gives us opportunity after opportunity. He gives us chance after chance. And you want to know how God's truth is true? You want him to prove that he is true? You are still here. You still have an opportunity. You still have a chance today to get right. So to the world today, I tell you, it is decision time. Again, the onus is on you. The shoe is on your foot. God has given his rebuke. And God, he's still restraining the wicked and the evil. He is doing it today for you. To give you that chance, to give you that opportunity to get yourself right. Because the last thing that he wants to do is to, to again, judge you with that fiery indignation. He does not want you before his judgment seat to where he will cast you away from his presence for eternity. So again, to the skeptic today, I tell you, choose the Lord. When you choose God, your heart, it will be illuminated. I tell you today. But again, when you choose God, you are going to have some hard times because the world is going to feel betrayed by you. And the world is going to run up against you. Satan is going to run up against you as well. But as again, the writer said there in, in Hebrews, do not draw back to perdition. Do not draw back to perdition. Because again, God, he has something better than being cast away from his presence for eternity. God has riches. God has a reward that he desires for you to enter into. And so I go back to that door that was sat before the church in Philadelphia. And I tell you today that there is a door that is set before you and all you have to do is enter into it. And so that's what I desire for you today to do. Enter into the gates of his kingdom. Amen. 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 Hey, before you stop watching this video, I got one thing that I want to ask all of you to do. What is it that I want you to do? If you aren't already following this channel, I ask you today, make sure that you're following. Subscribe below. And if you do that, I also ask all of you, make sure that you share this video, this channel with someone somewhere so that all of us can grow in our wisdom, our knowledge, and our faith in the Lord. And I ask all of you, participate in today's sermon as well. If you have any questions or any comments, don't be afraid to leave a comment below.